And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post Podcast. It's Tuesday morning. An eclipse happened. That was cool. And we are in the last week of the NBA regular season. It winds down this weekend. Teams have three or four games left. And then we will have a play-in tournament. The Bulls-Hawks Invitational or the Lakers-Warriors Invitational. Take your pick. Um, And boy, oh boy, Bobby Marks. The standings are a complete mess. Uh, Outside of, it appears we have a Mavs Clippers trilogy locked in for the first round of the playoffs. Buckle up for that. Kawhi versus Luka 3.0. Not long ago, Bobby, three, it's probably not three years ago because the pandemic screwed up the schedule. But that 2021 series in the first round between those two teams, when Dallas went up 2-0 in L.A., and it was like Armageddon for the Clippers. Like, it was over. And, and then they went to Dallas for game three. And I don't remember what the score was, but it was like 30 to 10 in the first quarter. Luca was just step back over Zubats, step back over Zubats, step back over Zubats. And you just had this feeling in your, this hole in your soul for on behalf of the Clippers almost. Like, it's done. It's over. And then they dug out and dug out and Kawhi went Superman mode. I can't wait for that series. But Bobby Marks, how are you, sir? I'm doing great. That that series, I think that was the downfall of um, Christoph's Porzingis, I believe, right? That was the, and I think I heard him on a JJ Reddick podcast when he basically said, you know what? I'm just going to stand in the corner series there where basically he felt like he was not being used. And, uh, um, but yeah, this is, um, you forgot to say that the other series that's that, uh, or the other playoff series that's all said is the nine ten uh, play in in the Eastern Conference between the Atlanta Hawks and Chicago Bulls. Well, I called it the Hawks Bulls Invitational, and by the <laughs> way, we should mention uh, Trey Young, according to Woj yep. and the team's press release, was cleared for cleared for everything. I guess cleared for contact, cleared for takeoff, cleared for everything. The Hawks have been pretty solid without Trey Young. I a, a solid enough over a long enough sample, although it's not a long sample; it's like twenty games that I just like, there is no other reasonable outcome to me other than trade one of the two guards this summer with the one caveat. And Nate Duncan told me the sort of expounded on this yesterday to me, like you could get to the off season and maybe the offers aren't as good as you think they should be. I actually don't think that would be the case. I think if they actually made Trey young available, there'd be some pretty big offers for him. I don't even care which one they trade. It's time to break it up, but yes, we will see. The Bulls back in the play-in. The Hawks back in the play-in. Um, I'm going to give you first pick. We're going to talk about all the mini races within the 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 playoff picture. No, by the way, one place there's no race. Every time I look at the standings, I do a double take that Boston is 15 games up in the Eastern Conference. Like that is, it's hard to be 15 games up on second place in an 82 game season. Like that is outrageously great play by Boston and outrageously poo poo play by the rest of the Eastern conference. So Bobby Marks pick a playoff race that you find the most interesting or impactful of all the mini races. And it could be impactful for the title picture. This season could be impactful for the off season and star player movement, whatever you want, Mr. Marks. I think for me, it's it's the Western Conference and it's the group of teams towards the back end. It, it's in that six, seven, eight range, um, which would be Phoenix, uh, New Orleans, um, not necessarily Sacramento. I mean, I know they're still, they're still in it. They're, they're still, still in, in it, Bobby. It. I know. I know they are. They, they've got no Monk. They've got no Kevin Herter. Um but it's it's that it's that Phoenix New Orleans, um, which Phoenix has a tiebreaker over New Orleans um, in that six seven range right there. Certainly, you can say the, the back end with the, the Lakers and the Warriors. But I, for me, it's it's because I think as bad as Phoenix has been in certainly in the fourth quarter um, offensively, um, a tough one uh, Sunday night uh, Sunday afternoon against New Orleans. A, a still, pivotal a pivotal game for New Orleans. Still, they had they're, to have they're, that game. They're still the wild card, right? I mean, I think they're still kind of the wild card out there, just based on the the potential of you know the, the firepower that they have. That's basically a five hundred team when the three are on the court. Um, so if that's that for me, that's the race, um, which would be Phoenix in New Orleans, and certainly we could put Sacramento in that conversation. That six, seven, eight range there. Now, interestingly, um, all the projection systems still have the Pelicans as a fairly 
decent to heavy favorite to get the six seed, which is obviously like the coveted seed you avoid to play in. Now you might get Denver. We'll we'll get to that later. Uh, you might get the Denver punishment. As I keep saying, the Serbian bully just hovering all of this. Can this team win around? Can that team win around? Can this team win, make a deep playoff run? All of those questions are dead on arrival if you draw a fully healthy Denver Nuggets and Jamal Murray came back recently and looks good and they're good and they're the Denver Nuggets and they have Jokic and that's the end of the story. However, six is still better than seven because yeah. nobody wants to be in the play-in. Matchups be damned. You're not going to be able to game it, almost certainly not, although that Denver-Minnesota game tomorrow is going to be massive. So, as I said, Pelicans, despite the fact that they're now seventh, they have the same record as Phoenix, but Phoenix has the head-to-head -head tiebreaker is still a decent favorite for sixth. And I understand that. So here are the schedules. New Orleans has at Portland, at Sacramento. That's on Thursday. And one of the interesting things about this tier is there are, I believe, three or four head-to-head -head games between them still to, to happen. So New Orleans, at Portland, at Sac, at Warriors versus Lakers. Like, I get that they have an automatic win, allegedly, on that, on that slate in at Portland. Sorry, Portland. Just so it's just a there's just a lot of Ashton Hagen going on. So there's a lot of I'll tell you, man, Delano Banton. Let's just do the whole low post you, thing. You know, where it's we funny. Take you a text, sideways you, turn into into Delano Banton. Like, what is he? He's going insane. But you 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 texted me last week, like one of the more out of the blue texts about like, hey, uh, Jabari, Jabari Walker. Walker, Jabari Walker's contract, and literally, like, I felt like saying to you, right, do you have a camera in my office? Because I'm I'm finishing up the Portland offseason article, and I'm writing an, a, a paragraph on Jabari Walker as far as extension candidates there. So I like to remind <laughs> fans of the dregs that, like, yeah, I'm still watching. Like, I'm not gonna write about you that much because you're a dreg. I don't know if drag is a singular term or whatever, but you're you're not very good. And but I'm still watching Delano Banton. Okay, so New Orleans has the automatic win at Portland. Everything else is tough. Now Phoenix has Clippers, Clippers back to back against the Clippers, um, at SAC at Minnesota. So they have no automatic wins and nothing but chalk and whatever is left of the piece of chalk that was the Sacramento Kings. I get it. It's tough. The Kings have at Oklahoma City, home against the Pelicans, home against the Suns. So they get both of these teams. That's why you can't count them out. And they close with the automatic win at Portland. Um, the stakes here are huge. Like, like New Orleans two weeks ago was thinking – four or five, we're set. We're going to avoid the play. And it's been our only ticket into the playoffs. And, and we don't want to do it anymore. We're better than that. We've risen above that. Zion has hit a new level. Uh, had all those blocks the other day against Durant. Looked amazing. Um, it would be it would be pretty crushing for them to fall back into the play-in. Phoenix has as much at stake in this season as any team. Um, they've started to catch a little bit of a rhythm recently. I, I've liked the snap that they've played with. I think Royce O'Neal has really helped their team and helped their flow. Um, it seems like you're still a, a believer in their high end potential. I, yeah. I mean, cause at the end of the day, the, the rotation that they're going to have when they get into the playoffs is going to be probably, they're probably going to go seven, eight guys, right? Like their benches, their bench is not good at all. Um, so I am still a believer just because of the ability to kind of close. Um, but the, you know, as I, but as I said, like the concerning thing is man, fourth quarter offense has been, I mean, they are in the bottom. Um, they are in the bottom there as far as um, where they are. I mean, clutch games, 20 and 20, 20 and 21 this year, the year that they ran basically the table and then they lose to Dallas in the um, was a conference semifinals. They were 33 and nine. <laughs> I mean, how about that number? Um, and Ooh. fourth quarter, fourth quarter offensive rating, 103.8, 30th in the league. 13 and 10 since the All-Star break. So there, for me, it's still, there's, I still think there's something there. Um, you know, if, if you're at, listen, if you're at six and all of a sudden you get Denver at, and Denver is at three, I mean, it, I mean, it is what it is, right? I mean, but if you get OKC, perhaps, or if you do go back to seven, um, and you get you know, get the Thunder there, I I think you they can beat a Thunder team there. I think they'll have their hands full of Minnesota. Um, but I do still I, I'm still I'm not ready to kind of throw in a towel with with uh, with Phoenix. 
I've got the towel. I'm like Rocky's trainer. I've got the to- or Apollo Creed's <laughs> trainer. I'm like I've got the towel like it's in my hand, and I'm thinking about it. And people are yelling at me to throw the towel, but I'm not throwing it quite yet. Um, it's again like I can't. They haven't been like just together enough for me to pick them over the Thunder or the Wolves who are getting cat back. We'll talk about him later. Or they could get cat back pretty soon anyway. We'll talk about them later. Um, I get the high end potential. I get it. I mean, it's Kevin Durant and Devin Booker and Bradley Beal. And by the way, this whole like, it seems like every month with Phoenix, there's this like, there's this narrative of, okay, Bradley Beal's the point guard now. And like, we've shifted our offense. He's, he's got a new role. And like, I, I watch the games and I just, I don't really see it. I don't really notice any change. Like they're, I don't really care who the point guard is or whatever. I just care that decisions are made quickly. Kevin Durant is involved. They hunt the right matchups. They use Grayson Allen as a screener more on and off the ball. Like he's one of the best shooters in the league and often has the worst defensive player on the other team on him. It's a weight, not a waste, but they should involve him more in on ball stuff. Not necessarily as the ball handler. Um, I just haven't just hasn't clicked a lot enough for me well the big thing is is like you know can you put together four a plus type games in a a best of seven right like i mean have you seen it have you seen that this year where they you know besides beating up on some of these these poor teams here how can you do that right i mean um you basically you know the win in denver i guess that was a few weeks ago where they blew that big lead and then wound up in in overtime like that's that's going to be the big thing is like the, the newness of this group together. They haven't been in one of these big spots before. I mean, Booker and Durant were, I guess, somewhat in that Denver series, which they lost, I think in six last year. Um, But Beal has not been in a big spot before. Um, Grayson Allen has Royce O'Neal has, um, you know, certainly with, with uh, in his days in, in, in Utah here. Um, And it's, I, as I said, a lot of it will be, a lot of it will be about matchup. Listen, they get they get OKC and and in the first round. There's going to be a lot of people that are going to be picking Phoenix just based on name alone. They're going to they're going to throw the Thunder youth. You know, Oklahoma City's never been here before. Uh, Phoenix has individually wise. Nurkic had 31 rebounds the last time the Suns played the one of the not the last time the last time the Suns played the Thunder was in Oklahoma City and the Thunder didn't have SGA and they rolled them and it was like oh boy that's a disturbing loss uh, for Phoenix. Uh, we should well. Um, I mean, if the Lakers beat the Warriors tonight in the nine ten bowl, like they're not out of this yet. They're not no. out of like, can I at least get into the top half of the play in bracket? Sixth is probably a bridge too far for them. Um, I'm looking at the projection systems now. Lakers sixth is is going to be. A long shot for them, yeah. depending on which system you look at. It's like 12, 15 percent to get sixth. Um, sometimes. Yeah, I mean, they they got Golden State, Memphis and <clears throat> at Memphis, at New Orleans. Those are their th- their um, their three. I mean, this the game tonight um, or, you know, Tuesday night is 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 huge. Right. But I mean, seven, eight, seven, eight's in play for them. Yeah. And that's oh, a yeah. big that's a big deal to get two shots to win one game. And I think that would count as like a decent season for them. And they have really found their groove this is just a good team now um i saw them saturday um when i was in la i went over and watched them play the day game um the mat the 12 30 game against cleveland and um that's it, probably one of the better complete games and they gave up the lead but man they 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 played you know ad you know basically locked up you know whatever they threw at him either jared allen or evan evan mobley here um and when D'Angelo Russell's making shots, man, they're tough. Um, he you know, was they on. Follow- he was on one in that game. Yeah, I mean, they didn't help the next night. You know, you get no LeBron and you get AD leaves, and then you lose at home to to Minnesota, and then you're basically kind of now you're in a you know you're fighting right now you're fighting to try to to, to get out of that um, that nine ten game. AD and Chris Middleton just taking shots to the face. A lot of shots to the face. Chris Middleton had a dental thing in the game the other day. AD keeps getting hit in the eye. Stay away from AD's eyes. Look, I, the Lakers, you know, Charles Barkley made fun of ESPN for covering the Lakers so much. And he was, he was right at the time. And I've poked fun at us for talking about the Lakers every day. Can the Lakers make a run? There's only so many ways you can ask that same question over and over again. They're playing well. They have now settled in to a groove. They, they, they're, 
their scoring margin is now solidly positive. It was solidly yep. negative a lot of the season. They're number two in offense for the last two months now. Like this lineup with D'Lo, Reeves, and Rui around the two stars, it works. And if they get anything off the bench, and it's a little bit hit or miss, but like if they can get two guys of the Dinwiddie, Prince, now Hayes is playing, you know, those kind of guys, can they get two of them to give them one and a half of them to just make some shots? And Dinwiddie's shown some life lately. They're a dangerous team, and they're going to grind it down against any of the – now, Denver, again, you're dead on arrival. You draw Denver, you're dead on arrival. But it, against these other teams, they're going to grind it down, slow it down, bully you in the paint. LeBron is still one of the greatest chess masters in the game. And AD – the, the, I mean, D'Lo's gotten a lot of attention, deservedly so. I offered my formal apology to him already. AD has been unbelievable this year. Oh, unbelievable. Unbelievable. I, I think he belongs toward the top of the Defensive Player of the Year conversation. I don't hear his name there much. There's a lot of Gobert. There's a lot of Wemby. I guess Wemby yeah. has sort of taken over that conversation, just like a tidal wave of arms. Yeah. Um, Bam gets talked about a lot. Then you got your Herb Jones contingent over here yelling for Herb Jones. You got your Derek White contingent over here. My AD yeah. is just is right there. I, I think I would put Tatum first team all NBA in that fifth spot yeah. over AD, but it's down to those two guys. Now AD has jumped Kawhi for me with Kawhi missing these games late in the season. And he's jumped Durant with Durant's just Durant's been great. It's just felt a little bit up and down shooting wise lately. And Rui Hachimura, I guess I'm going to have to take the L on kind of just assuming based on his track record that he could not replicate the shooting that he had in last year's playoffs because yep. he is more than replicating it. And I, I said that now in my defense to defend myself, I did say in the playoffs, the shooting is great and it'll go up and down. He just played in that playoff run. Like you never know how a guy who spent his entire career on a crap team yep. is going to react to high pressure playoff games with LeBron James, like glaring at you when you make mistakes, he was up for it. And he played with a new level of toughness and physicality and urgency, just urgency to his movements and decisiveness that you could tell that was real. And that would carry over. He has been outstanding. I, he's making a late, like, do I need to consider him for most improved player? It, it, he's had a great, great season for them. Congrats. Well, they, they nailed that trade and they nailed that contract. Rob well, did. I mean, I mean, it's almost like with um, you know, my, like the concern, you know, just shifting gears real quick, like Dallas getting PJ Washington, who had, you know, basically being on a Charlotte team for, you know, the last four or five years and, and doing nothing except a couple of playing appearances and hits two big threes uh, Sunday against Houston here. The one thing I like about, the Lakers too. And you know, 23 and nine in clutch games tied with Dallas for first. Right. Um, the hard part is, you know, before that Minnesota game, I think they had won like eight or nine and an eight of nine, but they had not moved off that nine seed. Right. They were just sitting there and they basically had, I guess, one and a half eh, average month. Right. And that basically kind of cost them being kind of a 500 team then. Um, you know, if you had to ask me, like, I, I kind of, I really want the Pelicans to make the playoffs just because I want to see Zion in the spotlight. The last time we saw him in the spotlight was the in-season tournament. It did not go well. He has never yeah. made the playoffs. He has never played in the play-in. Um, so that will be a first, I think. Um, I, I kind of think they might be weirdly the most complete team of all of these teams, including the Lakers. They might even have the highest ceiling, which sounds sacrilegious to say about Phoenix, but given what we've seen of New Orleans this year, I don't think th they just have been better at a higher level than Phoenix. They don't have Brandon Ingram right now. Um, he he's could return soon based on the public timetables that they've given. Uh, we just have to see it and see what he looks like. Um, I, I want to see them in the playoffs, but if I'm the Warriors... And I might be stuck in tenth, and I might be. If we if they lose tonight, they're definitely gonna be stuck in tenth. What I'm rooting for then is I want the Lakers to pass the Kings. I want the Kings to fall into the nine ten game without yeah. Malik Monk, without Kevin Herter, and the Kings yeah. have fought hard. Trey Lyles coming back has been huge for them. He's the he, he might be my most underrated reserve in the NBA. And then I want. 
the Lakers to beat the Pelicans in the 7-8 game and New Orleans with all the pressure in the world now at home in that scenario in New Orleans to have to beat the Warriors in a one game for the eighth seed scenario. And then I'm in. And then it's like, then I'm at the mercy of the matchup gods. Um, let's talk about, do you have any other thoughts on these teams? Because now I'm going to I'm gonna make my matchup. Nope. Go ahead. As long as we're talking West and we're going to bring in Tim Bontem shortly to talk East with us. Uh, let's talk about the race for the number one seed in yeah. the West. Because that is, we keep mentioning the Denver Spectre, the Spectre of Jokic hovering over all of this. Um, this is still very much in play. Minnesota is the big favorite for it right now in the in the projection systems. They're not that big. They are 54 and 24. The Nuggets are 54 and 24. The Wolves currently have the tiebreaker um, over the Nuggets by virtue of head-to-head. If they win on Wednesday, tomorrow, it's probably over. Minnesota gets the number one seed. Yeah. If yeah. Denver wins and they win out, they would obviously get the number one seed. But Minnesota would still have a shot at it. Um, and then Oklahoma City is one game behind them, still at 53 and 25, despite the fact that SGA and J Dub have been out. And their schedule is Kings at home, Spurs at home, Bucks at home, Mavs at home, all at home. And one of the Minnesota Denver group will have 25 losses after Wednesday. And Oklahoma City has the tiebreaker over Denver. Yep. Um and they're head to head even with Minnesota. Uh this is a this is a very important race, obviously, for home court. But um, you know, again, if Minnesota wins on Wednesday, Denver would need them to lose two of their other three remaining games to have any shot at the number one seed. And Denver would have to then win out. And Minnesota's other games are home against the Wizards, chalk it up. Home against the Hawks, you better win that one. Yep. And then home against Phoenix in the finale in a huge game. So they're not going to lose two of those games. They should not lose two of those games. So Wednesday is win in your number one for Minnesota if they take care of business tonight against Washington. Yeah, um, and Denver's got – I mean, Denver's schedule too. I mean, they got Utah, Mini, at Utah, Mini, at San Antonio, at Memphis. So you can assume – you should assume – and again, some of these games are tonight, so we'll see. Denver should win their other three games. So this is a massive swing game on Wednesday. And I keep reading about how, well, once that game is over, we're going to have some idea where Denver is seated. And so of teams will start jockeying to avoid them. Maybe these people are smarter than me. I don't really see how you can do that because Denver is either going to be one, two, or three, four, five is locked in six, seven, eight. You can't really game for because you're not going to game your way into the play in. You're not going to know where Denver is going to be, even if they lose and they're not going to be one. You're not going to be certain they're going to be two or three. Like, I, am I missing something? I don't know no. how you can game it you to can't. avoid Denver. You can't because how there's so much um, influx in, in the Western Conference that it's not like it's just one race, right? It's not like it's, um, you know, the, you know, you, it's the four, it's the, um, the five, six, teams in five, six are trying to avoid the three seed and Denver's already locked. I mean, there's so many, there's so many uncertainty here, except for, as you said, um, the four five game, which is Dallas, um, the Clippers Dallas, um, that you, you can't game it as far as trying to avoid Denver. It's, it's just not, it's just not possible. Now, does that change when we get to the end of the week in the weekend? But what do you want to do? You want to get into playing? <laughs> <laughs> you want to get into playing just so you you uh you avoid Denver who's the three seed? I mean, come on, you're not gonna do that. No, you're not. And you're not even necessarily gonna have control of that if you're in the Phoenix, New Orleans, Sacramento bucket based on what happens between now and then. I mean, the Lakers may be stuck in the play in or probably gonna be stuck in the play in, but it, it you know, you just can't and it's not like you're gonna get in the play in and then say, okay, Denver's two should we try to get the eighth seed? Like, should we, if we're seven and eight, should we lose the first game and try to win the second game to get the eighth seed? I, you know, that would be some next level chicanery. Um, it's so interesting how, what a championship does for you. It does interesting. It makes sense what a championship does for you. We're a year removed from like, gosh, I don't know. Should we believe it? Like I believed in Denver, but like, should we believe in Denver? Is Denver? And, and now it's just like, is anybody going to pick anybody other than Denver to win the West? I mean, they're, I, I'm not going to. They've been my yeah. favorite all year long. None of these teams have showed me enough. The Clippers for that 30-game stretch yep. 
were the only team in the West that showed me like, okay, that's a team whose ceiling is high enough to be Denver. And that stretches a long time ago. And I don't know what the hell to make of the Clippers in the last two months. Now that comeback against Cleveland on Sunday uh, was a really great win and yep. felt like a win they really needed. Um, and it was a, it was a gutty win. Paul George was unbelievable. I found it interesting that Ty Lue did not bring James Harden back into the game. Now James Harden was questionable for that game. And so maybe he just wasn't feeling right. His offense was okay. His defense was horrific, even by James Harden standards in that game. And I thought Ty Lue made health aside, made the right call to keep him on the bench. And that's one of the things I really like about the play in and the sort of flux of the standings this year play in always. And this year, uniquely, there's just so many seeds at stake. Like you're seeing coaches coach these games with playoff level urgency. Like Jonas Valanciunas played four minutes the other night. Willie Green just benched him. Just second half. Like you're not, not even second half, second quarter on, you're not playing. We don't think you're good enough for this matchup. We're going to play with Larry Nance 32 minutes, figure out the rest of the minutes at center. You've had Harden benched in that game. Every game, JB Bickerstaff, Boy, the noise coming out of Cleveland is not great. And by the noise, I just mean what the players said on yeah. the record after that game yeah. against the Clippers. Yeah. Um, it's like pick a big man to bench, like one of Mobley yeah. and Allen is isn't closing the game every game. They did that, you know, that happened Saturday against um uh, against the Lakers, right? I mean, um Evan Mobley was not good in that game at all. Um, and they were they basically went Jared Allen down the stretch and they basically went it with a smaller unit and um I will talk about Cleveland when when Tim gets on, but I've got um, I got some concerns about Cleveland just from a just from a Donovan Mitchell health standpoint and kind of just figuring out kind of you know lineups there. I guess I would be curious, Bobby, to hear your thoughts on. I haven't had, been had a chance to ask you about this. Uh, the Wolves, I, I believe they're now eleven and five without Carl Anthony Towns, and Nas might be twelve and five now. I might be yeah. missing the, their most recent win there, and Nas Reed has been outstanding. Um, I think he has taken the lead in the six man of the year race right now. He would be my pick for six man of the year. He's, he's left Malik Monk through no fault of Malik Monk. Malik Monk had a slumpy uh, four games. Tim Bontemps is in the house. We're going to get, we're We're still talking West Tim Bontemps. Who's your six man of the year right now? Bogdan Bogdanovich. Oh, I love it. He's on my – he's right now he'd be a tentative third on my ballot. We're talking about Nas Reed. I, I currently have Nas Reed. I mean, Nas has had a great year. I just think Bogdan has been the most impactful bench guy by a good amount in the league. Though it didn't help you win your bet with me on the Hawks. Thanks for reminding me of that. Can you leave? You're done now. You're you're free to leave the podcast. Uh, oh, you know what? You know what? It's an easy hundred bucks. It's an easy you know hundred bucks. Tim Bontemps did not. Did, he did not have that Mets hat on last week when it was zero and five. You know, meet the Mets. Of, four out of five. Meet the it. Mets. Step right up and greet the Mets. I Are they bad this actually, year? Are my beloved Mets have, bad? I couldn't actually have told you what the Mets record is right now. Four and it's six. Just, yeah, I, I I got the math from the zero and five and four and one, but. <laughs> Donovan Mitchell's beloved New York Mets. My sure. beloved New York Mets, although I don't think I could name is is Alonzo still on the team? Pete yeah. Alonzo still is on the team. That I know. Didn't they sign somebody good? Like a pitcher or something? I don't know. I just, I, I I miss the Mets. I, I really would like the Mets to be part of my life. Again, they're bad again. It's it's not going great under Steve Cohen's stewardship. It's you could make them. You could make them part of your life. You could watch the games. That is. That is. That is an active choice you would have. Oh, 162. They're Two. fast. They're <laughs> faster now, right? The pitch clock worked. They're fast. Okay, enough they, baseball. Are, so you have are faster. So Tim, what happens to our bet? What happens to our bet if the Hawks get out of the play in and win a first round series? Do we? Can we call it? Can we call it even? Or do I still lose because it was a top five seed? Like, what if they? What if they actually? What if the they catch the magic of Trey Young's return and and you know Onyeka Kongu comes back and what, what Quinn Snyder's glasses get even redder and and Harry the Hawk is running around the sidelines I think his name is Harry like what do I get any credit for that is this plausible would, the East is so bad that this is not implausible I would get a hundred dollars and you could try to claim some sort of alternate victory that's what would happen. So you have Bogey as six man. Uh, okay, Bobby, I interrupted you, and then then Tim, I'd like to hear your answer on this too. What do you make of um, 
of the of the Wolves being twelve and five or eleven and five without Cat and the impact of Cat's potential return uh, for the playoffs. Well, I mean, I, I think it's kind of balanced it out a little bit. I mean, it's given basically kind of Anthony Edwards an island on his own, right? Basically kind of, um, you know, the ability to kind of spread the floor. I think it's, you know, the as you said, Nas Reed, six man, his minutes probably, I've, I haven't looked at his minutes, but I've, I've kind of gotten a little bit of an, uh, an, an uptick here. Um, it's going to be it, when you have a guy that's out, been out for a month and now you're going to integrate him, and you're going to be the number one seed and, and potentially become the one, number one seed or a top two. And in in the, it's, it's going to be, you know, now, now, now the pressure's on right now, now the pressure's on as far as what, uh, what, what you have. I mean, they were, um, per 100 plus 10 with cat on the floor. It's pretty, pretty high number. Right. Um, but as I said, it is hard putting, you know, with one week left in the season or less than a week, um, integrating one of your top players on a team that is expected to go pretty far in the Western Conference. Tim? If you look at Minnesota, obviously they're a team that has been carried by their defense. Their offense has not been up to the same level this year. And for them to have a chance probably to be their highest level team, they're going to need Carl Towns to be out there scoring for them. I think it it does sort of make you look towards the future and the future financial crunch they're eventually going to have and say they still got a chance with this formation of their team to be a potentially high-level team if Carl's not on it, which does lead to some interesting questions down the road. But for right now, for them to have the best chance to make a run, you know, you look at their schedule, they've played a, several soft teams in that run, which helps them have that record. Now, they've done a phenomenal job fact that they're going to finish first or second is a huge credit to them not having Carl but if you're going to if you're going to make the kind of run Bobby just alluded to and not be a first round exit team which in the west is possible for just about everybody but Denver um they're going to need to get Carl ready to go over the next week and a half because you know if they're going into the if they're going into a series against Dallas or you know, the Lakers or any of these teams, Phoenix, uh, the Pelicans, whoever, um, you know, you're playing somebody really good and you're going to have to be ready to go right off the bat or you could be in trouble very quickly. Yeah, I've said from the beginning, I think their ceiling without him is one round. And after that, I don't think they can win. Now, obviously, crazy stuff could happen. And you draw the Kings in the second round and I sound like an idiot or something, but... um as well as they played, and they've been great. And Nas Reed is just an outstanding offense, but shooting forty two percent on threes, like that's Towns. Like that's what Towns does. Not quite on the same volume because he's he's more of a well. I mean, he he does a lot of stuff on offense. He's a good post player. He's a good on. He's a good ball handler. He's a good transition player. Nas Reed in transition, by the way, quietly one of the best big man shows in the NBA, busting out like in and out dribbles with his left hand and stuff. I just think the ceiling with Towns is higher, and the ceiling at really matters when you start playing the other best teams in the league. Like you just can't win these gritty defense only games over and over again. You need some easy ones now and then. And towns like, Oh, towns had 38 tonight and the wolves won by 12. Like you need a couple of wins like that. It's a shame. They really can't play all three of them together. Um, they've done it in little fits and spurts they, and they, they don't really need to when they have McDaniels and Edwards and Conley and Nikhil Alexander Walker and all their guards. Monty Morris has been good. They don't need to, but Nas Reed has been so good, man. It's been fun. Okay. I wanted to talk East, which is why, um, Tim, we've been, we've been picking which playoff races within the playoff race are most interesting to us. And we've done the West. My pick, if I had number one pick and I did not is the entire Eastern conference from two to sixth with the addendum of can Philly rise to six. This has just become such a cluster with Milwaukee losing four games in a row to the Wizards, the Grizzlies, the Raptors, and then the Knicks on Sunday. Now they've had injury-related absences in all those games. They missed two, Middleton missed one, and then got hit in the mouth against the Knicks. Giannis missed one. Missed uh missed one that Dame played, so they have not been whole for any of those games. He'd still like to beat some of those teams, even if you're not whole. And so the two seed is now in play. The Bucks are 47 and 31. 
the Magic and the Knicks both are 46 and 32. The Cavs are 46 and 33. And the Pacers are like, hey, we're 45 and 34. We have the 16th ranked defense since the trade deadline. That doesn't sound good. For us, it's awesome. Pascal Siakam is balling out for us. Why not? Like, we could just accidentally be the third seed in the Eastern Conference because all you people can't get out of your own way other than the Magic, I guess, who are doing what they're supposed to do. And the Knicks are muddling along, playing everyone 45 minutes a game. I will start with you, Tim. The Cavs are 11 and 17 in their last 28 games. The Bucks are 6 and 10 in their last 16 games. Which of these is most concerning to you? The Bucks, clearly. The Cavs, their ceiling was to maybe win a round in the first place, and Donovan Mitchell being banged up, among other things, it's sort of easier to say this is why the Cavs aren't playing well, even though the Cavs are certainly concerning uh, on a variety of levels. The Bucks are supposed to be a championship-caliber team in the eyes of many people, and uh, as you just pointed out, they just lost. I don't really care who wasn't playing. They had Giannis playing in two of the games, Dame playing in the other. They lost to three of the worst teams in the league, two of whom – the Wizards and Raptors have been truly horrendous. And like then they play the Knicks. And <laughs> I don't know Brunson. why that made me laugh. Truly horrendous. Like, not just horrendous, well, but the Raptors, at the, the, at the truest lost, nature of that word, horrendous. The Raptors had lost 15 games in a row when they uh, lost in, in when they beat the Bucks in Milwaukee uh, in a game the Bucks really needed. And then they gave up a million points to Jalen Brunson again, proving their season-long Ooh. issue of not being able to guard anybody. So, you know... Milwaukee fired their coach midseason. They have championship level expectations. They have the potential to potentially see the Philadelphia 76ers with a healthy Joel Embiid in the first round. I, I think that there should be, uh, it's a DEFCON 1 situation in Milwaukee, I would say, pretty quickly. People, for, people can, I throw out, can, I, can I throw out a stat for those, those, those um, memorable games that Tim just referred that Toronto, Washington, New York, um, always, Memphis. always, Bobby. Zero and three in clutch games last four. Eight point three percent on threes. Eight point three. Eight point three percent. Okay, so I mean, it, that's kind Problem, of that's prob that's problematic, Bobby. I think. <laughs> well, but look, that's also the early season clutch stuff kind of evening out yeah. late in the season. The Bucks like punched way above their weight because they yep. won every close game. Um, by the way, Jalen Brunson. Tim Tim may know this because he's he he may have looked it up. How, what do you think Jalen Brunson's uh, scoring average against the Bucks is this season in five games? They played five times because of the IST. I'm gonna guess it's over 40 points. It's not quite 40. 37. 37. Yeah, I knew, I knew on it was 53 percent. I mean, he just eats that drop defense alive. And Jalen Brunson, I I hesitate to say he he might be the most creative. In a, in a calculated way, ball handler in the entire league. Uh, he just has this knack for rejecting the screen on pick and rolls when you don't expect it. Even though he does it a lot, he doesn't overdo it, and he tends to do it after like four possessions in a row, which he hasn't. Like, like against Milwaukee, every possession starts with guard, guard, screen to get Damian Lillard on to... Um, Jalen Brunson and Jalen Brunson can just cook Damian Lillard from there and the Bucks are switching those screens so they're giving the switch and so he'll mix it up on the fourth one and be like I'm just going to reject this because you're going to be prepared to switch it you're giving me the switch and and I'm, I'm going to catch you by surprise and get to the rim he's been unbelievable um DEFCON one people forget is the most serious DEFCON of the DEFCONs it's a thermonuclear war is currently happening and I, I know this from the 1980-something movie War Games starring Matthew Broderick and Ali Sheedy, who, after the release of that movie, I had a crush on Ali Sheedy for like seven consecutive years. It, it, still, it still lingers in my brain somewhere. Um, the Bucks in those 16 games where they're 6-10 and 10 are 16th in offense, 23rd in defense. They're 15th in opponent free throw rate and 12th in defensive rebounding. Those sound good. They're not good. That that represents decline in what I call the Mike Budenholzer metrics for the Bucks, where they were like number one in those things over and over again. And once Doc came in and kind of rebutted them, they started shining in those categories. Again, they're not. They're dead last in forcing turnovers. 
which is which is kind of ironic because that's what Adrian Griffin came in and said, oh, we can't be dead loud. I'm going to do my Toronto stuff and we're going to fly around and force in turnovers. They don't do any of that. Um, and they just can't contain the ball. That said, well, I'll just ask both of you. We'll start with you, Bobby, and then you, Tim. Who's the biggest threat to upset Boston in the Eastern Conference? Philly. Despite the fact that they're very likely to be seventh that, I mean, or, that's, or that's eighth, the, yeah, that's the that's the that's the wild card, right? That their seeding would would could do them in, right? Like because of how much ground they would have to make up this week to get out of that seven hole, um, but. And you'd have to basically get through two, right? So you might you might have to get through Milwaukee and somebody else just to get to a third uh, you know, to an Eastern Conference Finals. And who the hell knows where where Philly would be health wise with Embiid and stuff like that. Um, so I would say Philly. I know I know the logical what the logical answer is, right? The logical answer with the team that has probably on paper the talent with Giannis and Lillard and Middleton, a healthy Middleton, would have the best probably opportunity there. Tim? Boston. Well, that's not allowed. <laughs> sure it is. The Celtics are dramatically better than everybody. I would have taken them. Yeah, they're 15 games up. Boston. They should go They should go 12-2 and two or better in the Eastern Conference playoffs. And if they if they lose in the playoffs, it's going to be because they get in their own way to such a dramatic degree that they – stunningly are upset in the playoffs there's not any of these teams none of these teams should be able to give the much of a series at all though i do agree with bobby that philadelphia and b joel and has looked to me i was at two of the first three games he played he looked as good as i think you could possibly have hoped for he was able to play 30 plus minutes in both games obviously he ran out of gas later in the miami game which is totally understandable but his touch looks great he looks to be in good shape i'm going to be at their game Tuesday night, and I'll also be at their game Friday night against Orlando. Now, you mentioned Orlando before. They it's play one. Houston Tuesday night. They have a game against Milwaukee Wednesday. They have Philly Friday. They're at, and then they, I believe they host Milwaukee again yeah. Sunday. If they lose two of those three games between the Bucks and the Rockets, if Philly beats them on Friday, they finish ahead of Orlando. That might be Philadelphia's best chance to get out of the play-in based off of their tiebreaker situations around there. So if you're a Sixers wow. fan or if you're watching to see the, the Eastern Conference playoff situation play out, watch the next two days as the Orlando plays Houston on the road, which is a tricky game, and then goes to Milwaukee. Because they have Milwaukee twice. Yeah, they have Milwaukee, Philly, they, Milwaukee. If they go one and two of those three games, Philly has Brooklyn and Detroit in their other two games. They certainly should win those games. And if they do... There, the season for both of those teams could come down to Friday night in Philadelphia. Um, and if Philly wins that game, they'll have the the tie break. And I'll, if, in that scenario, they would finish tied and Philly would be out of the play-in. And Orlando could be in it. Which shows how bunched up this all is because Orlando could be second if they win those two games against Milwaukee. They could be seventh if they lose them both. But, that, just, that just blew my mind. I didn't even consider that. I did. I mean, I, I I looked at the standings and I looked at Indiana, Miami, Philly, and the fact that if if Philly goes three and zero to finish the season, which is which is potential, which is very likely, uh, if they finish forty seven and thirty five, that's the best record they can finish with. They mm-hmm. still need Indiana to lose twice to pass the Pacers, and Indiana's schedule is at Toronto, at Cleveland, home against the Hawks. Indiana should be able to win two of those three games. And they so you need, yeah, right. Yeah, right. And so right. you want to pen Indiana to sixth or better and pen Philadelphia to seventh or worse. And the projection system certainly suggests you do that. Um, and Miami, by the way, has the Raptors twice to finish the season. So that they're there, they have in the Atlanta and Dallas are their other games. They have a path to winning out if they can beat the Dow, if they can beat Atlanta and the Mavs. Um, so this is all in flux um that's a great point about orlando i i honestly didn't consider that scenario where orlando goes zero and four and philly passes them well they um, just gotta go they gotta go one and three if philly goes undefeated they gotta go one and three so and and obviously they play philly in one of the games 
So and Philly's other two games are Pistons Nets. All at I believe all at all in Philly, correct? All at home. Yeah, they're home all they're home all week. But like I said, that's that's where the variance is because if Orlando sweeps those games with Boston or with uh Milwaukee, they control their destiny to be second in the Eastern Conference. So, you know, that's that's where we're talking about. But look, the the Celtics have if the Celtics win tonight against Milwaukee, they have the same lead over the second place team as the Denver Nuggets do over the six, the 11th place Houston Rockets in the West. So whatever we want to try to make up that some of these teams should be able to beat Boston or be competitive with Boston. The truth is Boston is putting together a historically great season and this should be the year they steamroll the competition and reach the finals in with relative ease finally. And I think if they do, that's a sign of real growth for them. And if they're struggling in series against these teams, whoever it is, that's a sign of we could be looking at the same old Celtics in the playoffs. And it makes it harder for me to pick them to beat Denver in what I think will be the eventual finals. Did either of you guys listen to the Bill Simmons, Ryan Russillo podcast yesterday? No, not yet. Simmons no. Simmons put the put the hoax on Boston. He, he, had, he admitted... He admitted on a Celtics fan text chain that he texted it's in play for Boston to go 12 and 0 in the Eastern Conference playoffs and immediately regretted putting it into the ether that they could do that. And the I most enter- No, sorry. Sorry. Well, the the most entertaining scenario just from a immediate panic standpoint is Philly is in the play and loses the 7-8 game, wins the next game and gets eighth. And, and wins game and, one. It wins game one in Boston. <laughs> That's the most entertaining possible. And like Embiid has like 55 and just destroys yes. them in game one. And I would hope that there's like a two day break between games one and two to just soak in the panic. 17 different Joe Missoula press conferences between games one and two where he's where he strikes a tone between stoicism and contempt for every question about panic. And I, that would be the most entertaining possible solution. Um, to answer my own question, is it, do you guys think I'm nuts that I still think the answer is Milwaukee as the biggest I mean, threat can, to Boston? I mean, I, look, I think you can talk to your, like Bobby said before, they, uh, they would have the best player in the series and theory. If the game is close in the final five minutes, you would have the guy in Damian Lillard that you would trust more than the Celtics to operate in crunch time. So you can talk yourself into the Celtics, the, that being the team that gives the Celtics the biggest threat. I have, I don't know if I've said it on this pod or not, this year's Bucks team reminds me a ton every time I think about them and watch them of the 2019 Celtics, an immensely talented team that all season I kept being told was going to make a run and figure it out and all come together and it's all going to be great. They got to the second round. They won game one against Milwaukee. They immediately, and then they met a little resistance early in games two and three, and they just completely imploded, lost in five games in spectacular fashion, including Kyrie Irving trying to guard Giannis in game five and one of the stranger and just do a season that I've seen. Yeah, you um, and I were, were both at those games and both sitting in the same area, and I think we'll never, ever, there are certain sites you don't forget. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad, like Durant getting injured in the finals. I can, I can close my eyes and see it. I think yeah. you and I can close our eyes and see Kyrie Irving pointing furiously that he has Giannis and everyone else just sort of back off. I got it. And us being like, did he just, is that a thing? What, what yes. just happened? Both of those things from that same class are seared in my brain. The, the Kyrie doing that and, and Kevin getting hurt in the finals a few weeks later. It's quite so, a blast. So I think about this year's Bucks in a lot of ways, like I think about this year's Suns. It's like sometimes it's not going to happen. Like sometimes you just have a year where we can sit here and every week be like, well, see that game, that game they played, it all clicked. Like that's their ceiling. That's why they're scary. And then next week we come out and like, oh, they've lost two out of three. And like Durant was just standing in the corner of the whole game and you know, Giannis was spotting up around Dame Brooke Lopez pick and rolls, trying to figure out what to do in the half court. It's maybe it's it's like sometimes it's not going to happen, and you can sit here and blame health. Like I was, I I listened to the um, the Bucks broadcast of the Knicks Bucks loss uh, the other day on Sunday, and I think like four or five times the play by play announcer reminded viewers that the game really flipped when Chris Middleton got hit in the mouth. 
and left the game. I mean, just again, like two quarters ago, I don't know if you're just tuning in, like the game really flipped when Chris Middleton got hit. Okay, cool. Like maybe that's true. Life isn't always perfect in the playoffs. Life isn't always convenient. Someone is going to get hit in the mouth. Someone is going to sprain an ankle. Someone is going to go 0 for 10 from three. Dame's going to miss every shot at the rim. Part of winning a championship is winning when it is inconvenient for you. And so I'm tired of hearing like, oh, but if this happened, if that happened, if this happened, and yet I just can't, I can't find enough belief in any of these other teams other than Philly. And it's really just that I need to see where Philly ends up and how dangerous they are in terms of like, even, you know, if they're in the play in, you're in danger uh, by default. Um, but the Bucks, you know, I, as concerning as the defense is, we knew that would be concerning. What really concerns me is they're still kind of trying to figure it out offensively, figure out the right balance. You know, I talked about that Lakers double overtime game. Um, that the Lakers won in Milwaukee without, was that without, that was without LeBron. AD had a monster game in that game. Yes. Giannis set 45 ball screens in that game. It was his career high by nine. Like it wasn't even close. And we've all been clamoring for more of that all season. And yet in that game, I felt they overdid it. They overcorrected in terms of just like making him Tyson Chandler 2.0 and trying to figure out like, well, can he touch the ball in other ways? And then against the Knicks, I watched and I'm like, man, there's a lot of like Dame Brooke Lopez two man stuff going on. And that's cool. That works. But and Giannis can pick his spots to cut and do this. But there was too, there was too much Giannis just spotting up, which is useless. Um, and it just doesn't feel like they've found the right connectivity. And maybe that's maybe that really is because of Middleton being out. Because when they have Middleton, they can get in that flow where it's like Dame Brooke kick it to the other side. Chris Giannis two man game. Chris and Giannis have great chemistry. And it's those glimpses of that complete team that make me answer Milwaukee. I also think they play Boston decently um, head-to-head when when Boston won the most recent game that Giannis didn't play in and almost fell all the way from ahead to let Milwaukee come back and steal that game. There was a lot of panic in Boston and a lot of gloating in Milwaukee. Like, see, we have your number. Like, we almost beat you without Giannis. You guys can't score in the clutch. And I said my takeaway from their collective games this season is, Boston's better. Boston will win a playoff series. Milwaukee has absolutely no wing defense answer for anyone on the Celtics. Middleton is getting blown by left and right. But something about this Bucks team could make that a semi. I, I was like, it feels like a competitive six game win for Boston. You, Tim, seem like like it would be a blowout for Boston. Is that correct? You just think that's a walkover for Boston as things stand now or no? I think if it's not, it's a sign of the Celtics not being the team that they could be and the team that they might be after all the years of struggling through the playoffs. I mean, how I've had to listen to our, our pal Brian complain all year about the prospect of having to sit through more longer than necessary uh, Celtics playoff series this season. And, you know, that's, that's really what I think we're talking about. There's nothing about this season that indicates that the Milwaukee Bucks should be seen as a title contender at all. And there's nothing about this season that suggests that Boston should do nothing but steamroll their way through the Eastern Conference with relative ease. You know what the Celtics do? You know what they do? They ruin Memorial Day weekend. That's what they do. Every year, we're like, man, if this is a this is a five game series, I could have a barbecue. I could hang out with my friends. It's like, oh, in either way, last year they ruined it by not just bowing out in four games. They're like, all right, we're gonna go to seven, and then Jason Tatum's gonna sprain his ankle. We're gonna bow out. I how about not ruining Memorial Day weekend? The West takes care of business. The West is like, you guys want Memorial Day weekend? Here's a sweep. Boston, get it together. Wow. I tell you, they ruined my they ruined my Memorial Day weekend 22 years ago. The Boston Massacre, <laughs> up 20 going into the fourth quarter. I remember that game. Antoine Holy Walker, baby. Holy. Wiggling and jiggling, Antoine Walker. Uh, Tim, what's going on with Cleveland? Why do they suck now? Like, what's happening? 11 and 17 with everybody. I mean, not everybody, but part of it is Donovan Mitchell is has not been back, actually. Donovan Mitchell hasn't shot... Fifty percent from the field in a game since I have it written down somewhere and now I've lost it since Later. February twenty seventh. Hey, you're answering that's your own o- question. That's only seven games, so it's not like twenty games, but it's two he's also, months. He's also and he's also not played in a bunch of games. That's what which, I'm saying. It's only it's only yes. seven games for him. 
And I'm just saying for the listeners. Yeah. And he, he and he's below 40% from the field in six of those seven games. Is that all it is? It's not all of it, but it's a significant portion of it. Um, I, I think if you go back to December, the Cavs looked more or less like the team they do now, um, where they were scuffling and did not look very good. And the the fit between the two guards and the two bigs was very clunky and it was very uncertain what they were going to look like. And then they had the injuries to Darius Garland and Evan Mobley. We talked about, well, they're going to have to trade Donovan Mitchell. What's going to happen now? Are they going to go sideways? And instead, they coalesced into a team that made sense and ripped off. I think they went 18 and two over the next 20 games and looked great and were rolling along. And right around then, the two young guys came back. They played decently going into the trade dev art of the All Star break. And then Donovan Mitchell. Comes out of the all-star break, messes up his quad, hasn't been right ever, his quad slash knee, hasn't been right ever since. That's certainly a big part of it because he was playing at an all-NBA level this season. And the other part of it is their young guys have not been to the level they hoped this year. Like Darius Garland has looked kind of lost a lot of the time on the court. And I think Evan that's Mobley, the right I think that's the right word, by the way. It's a disturbing word to say about a player this good. I think that's the right word, lost. Yeah, they just don't have – when Donovan's not out there, they just don't have seemingly a lot of direction on offense in terms of what they're trying to do. And, look, Evan Mobley, we've talked about him a lot. He's obviously a talented player. Um, he has not really progressed as an offensive player. I know – I think you are on Nate's pod this week saying, I have no worries about where Evan Mobley's at. I got the point you were making because he's super young. But they – and you, you mentioned this on there too – The Cavs and the Wolves made trades at the same time for the same reason. They thought they had budding superstars on their team. The Wolves have one. Anthony Edwards is becoming one. The jury is out, I think, quite clearly on whether Evan Mobley is going to become that kind of player or if he's going to become somebody more like Derek Favors. Because, wow. Well, Derek Favors was a very good player who was a non-shooting four, which is the least valuable archetype of player in the league, was also the third pick in the draft, was also drafted super young, was also super toolsy, saying all this because the guy who drafted him is on the call. Uh, Listen, we we drafted Derek Favors in 2010. Played one year for you guys, right? We did, because besides his talent, we felt that he was, from a trade standpoint, that he had more value than DeMarcus Cousins would have in a trade if we had taken DeMarcus Cousins. At the end of the day, we should have the number one pick because we won 12 damn games that year. I mean, that, that's, just, the, that's the reality of it all. If we want to just cut to the chase here, right? Should have been grandfathered into it. Yeah. 70 losses? That is how 12, 12 and 70. That's right. <laughs> but, and look, I'm not saying, I'm not saying Evan Mobley is, you know, destined to, be a bench player or something. I don't mean that, but it, the fact that he has not really progressed offensively, it is, it is a problem for the Cavs and it does complicate what their overall path looks like. Cause again, like when they made that trade, the thought was, okay, this guy's going to be an all-star caliber player by his third year in the league. And you know, this year, Scotty Barnes made the all-star team. Two years ago, those two guys were neck and neck to win rookie of the year. If Evan Mobley had made the all-star team this year, then we would be looking at the Cavs' whole situation a lot differently. But he's still a good player. They're still a good team. It's not like the sky is truly falling there. But the whole vision for making that trade was that Evan Mobley could become the number one. And Donovan Mitchell is a great number two. You've got these other supporting guys, and then you've got a chance to really. I'm take not a step sure forward. that I'm not sure that was division. Like number one on offense, or just like the best guy on the team. I the best player on the team. So Evan Mobley, it, Evan Mobley, after his rookie year, like there were comparisons to Chris Bosh, like all these other like elite all time, great kind of players, right? Like that. The the the, the whole Tim was, Duncan's Evan, name got thrown around a little too sure. loosely. Evan, a little too Evan, loosely. Well, I mean, yes, he's one of the five best players of all time. But Evan Mobley looked like a guy who was on the path to being a perennial all-star power forward big in the league. And we're in year three. He's still in more or less the same place offensively. 
as he was then. Obviously a very good defensive player. And it, playing him with Jared Allen just leads to some clogging up of the paint and some complications on offense, which is why a lot of the season, especially since he's come back from injury, they have not played together very much at all. So, and, so I would know, push, I would push back. I think he's better on offense, but not in the ways that this team needs him to be better on offense. I think he's a better offensive player in two point range and as a passer from the elbows. And that's not necessarily what they need to make the leap that they hoped to make. Now the Gobert versus Mitchell trades is interesting on a, on a number of levels, because that was a moment in the NBA and you can throw the DeJounte Murray trade in there as well. That was a moment where a lot of teams just threw caution to the wind at the same time. The Gobert trade was almost a singular bet on Anthony Edwards. It, as much as it was on Gobert, it was a bet that that guy, that ball handler, can be a superstar apex number one ball handler in time for Gobert's prime to not have expired. Towns was there. And it was certainly a bet on Towns too and a bet on Jaden McDaniels becoming a real 3 and D wing plus that plus more than that. But none of those guys are ball handling stars. You need a ball handling star to win at the highest level. They only had one shot at that, and it was Anthony Edwards. He's come closer to paying off that bet than almost any human alive could have facing the kind of pressure and scrutiny that he has. The Cavs trade on Donovan Mitchell was, yes, a bet on Evan Mobley, but I think it was just as much a bet on like the Mobley, Garland, Allen infrastructure of young talent, including another ball handler in Darius Garland. Um, and that was the contrast with the Knicks, right? Like I, this is why I kind of liked this trade for the Cavs and would have been a little bit wary of it for the Knicks is the Cavs, their, their downside, they had such insulation from a, a, a catastrophic downside because they had all this young talent in the door. They had this infrastructure around him that the Knicks would not have had if they had traded everything for Donovan Mitchell. And it just hasn't borne quite enough fruit um for the Cavs and and there's a lot of reasons for that and one of which is that Donovan Mitchell hasn't been the same guy since the injuries started popping up two months ago um and you know I I said this yesterday but we said it at the time one of these teams who goes all in for a player like this just here's all the picks all the swaps whatever is and one of the reasons that teams felt safe doing that. Now, Cleveland felt safe doing that because they had this talent in the door already, and they said, well, we're never going to become the team that accidentally gives up a top five pick. Sorry, Bobby. Um, but okay. um, but they all thought, well, the league is evolving this way. Worst comes to worst, we'll just retrade somebody to the next irrationally exuberant team and get – a bunch of picks back. Yeah, not our picks. Like Cleveland won't with Cleveland's own picks are gone. They're not that worried about that because again, they have all the strong talent, but we'll at least recoup some picks. Someone is going to do that and be the test case for whether that's actually a feasible strategy. Um and and by the way, that they also gave up Larry Markin and Colin Sexton, who were kind of footnotes in that trade, not footnotes, right? Like Markinen's a star, and Sexton has been quietly very good for Utah this year. Um they gave up a lot in that trade, and if there's, you know, one of one of the GM, one of the one of the high level executives I talk to a lot, always reminds me, all your nice off season spitballing you do, it's interesting. We all do it. The playoffs frame it all. Like anything you're talking about before the playoffs is is fun, but premature. Well, if there's a team whose off season starts to look real different, if they flame out in round one. And in a way that can change the entire structure of the league's offseason, it, it might be Cleveland because you mentioned DEFCON one for Milwaukee, Tim. I mean, Cleveland, if they just, I mean, they're 11 and 17 in 28 games. 11 and seven, in, 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 yeah, in 28 games. They get in the playoffs as three, six, four, whatever, and get smoked in the first round like they did last year. There's a lot of the, pretty much the only thing that's not on the table is trading Evan Mobley. I think almost everything else would would have to just be either presented to them, forced upon them, or volunteered by them as a possible solution. 
Yeah, I mean, look, I think you could say that for a lot of teams. You could say that for Milwaukee. You could say that for Cleveland. You could say that for Miami. You could say that for Philly. You could say that for Minnesota. You could say that for the Clippers, for Dallas, for Phoenix, for, uh, you know, you go down the list. Like, there's, there's only so many teams. There's eight teams that can win a series. There's four teams that can make the conference finals. There's two teams that can make the finals. There's a heck of a lot more of each of those levels of the league. Uh, in terms of teams that think they can get to those places, then there are available places. And, so and any of these to... teams, any of these teams could be in the conference finals. Like I don't see it with Cleveland based on how they've played and what Donovan Mitchell's health has looked like. But like the Knicks, you know, Randall goes out and it's a catastrophe and their ceiling is lower and everyone is is crying about it. And I was sad about it too. They could make the conference finals. Like they're still really good. And if they have Ananobi and he came back, Runson, Ananobi. No Randall is plus a million per 100 possessions. Now, will that hold up? I don't know. Bogdanovich is getting in a groove off the bench and will play, should play all the non-Brunson minutes in addition to some minutes with Brunson too to kind of prop up the bench. Mm-hmm. You know they're tough as hell. They're going to mm-hmm. rebound and 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 run and defend and make all the winning play. Like, they could still make the conference. It's just matchups, right? Like, it's Boston avoidance, basically. Same as Denver in the, in the other conference. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's it's totally wide open for everybody. To circle back to Evan Mobley for a second, this is a very far ahead question, but uh, what are you giving him as a contract extension this summer? Not the max. Then you don't get I'm an extension. Gonna... There's no there's yeah. no choice. Like not, the, 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 the discussion well, is no, over. No, 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 I'm not no, doing no. The fun That's act. that is not the that is never the correct thing to say. There's no choice. There's always a choice. No, I'm saying there's if I'm a, if I if I'm Evan Mobley's agent, the discussion is Evan Mo- that, why that's is it. Evan why has Evan Mobley earned an automatic contract extension at a max number this summer? Do you want to go back and look at all the guys who have gotten the twenty five the fun max is is Wendy called? Well, it? yeah, I mean because what's going to happen is is that the likelihood is that Cade Cunningham will wind up getting a max contract, right? That's probably the who reality. would you rather give the twenty five percent max to, Cade Cunningham or Evan Mobley? Cade Cunningham. Sneaky most improved player candidate, by the way, Cade Cunningham. Now, what's the justification for that, Tim? Because people will think you're crazy. Detroit stinks. They haven't watched Cade Cunningham play this season. They don't they don't know his numbers. Do you Cunningham, really believe that? Kate, yes. Cade Cunningham is a six eight guy who can handle the ball, who can make plays, who can is a is a solid three point shooter. Like I would much rather have a six seven, six eight ball handling wing than a non shooting four. Look, like, I've been a Cade Cunningham believer from the beginning. It doesn't same- mean it doesn't mean five years from now the answer is going to be the same. But if we're talking about like Giannis Tedekupo didn't get a didn't get a max off his rookie contract. Yeah, it's that not, was th- Rudy Gobert didn't get a max contract off his rookie contract. Like it's it's not. There are plenty of guys who are Hall of Fame all time great players who didn't get the max automatically. I'm not, it, this is not an, this is not I, me I, saying Evan Mobley stinks. I, no. I, I, and, just, and you should, as I'm a not team. saying I would necessarily give Kate Cunningham a 25% max either, but the, the, the ball handling ball dominant wing in today's league is just a way more valuable player. And the, rec- the archetype of player Evan Mobley is right now. The record will show I never even wavered on Kate Cunningham or went out on him. The si- size plus vision is a really hard thing to, and obviously ball handling is a hard thing to find. And the shooting has, as as you said, if people need to check your shooting numbers, they've come along. Um, and you're right that teams, I think, have underused in some cases the hammer of restricted free agency. Like, no, this allows us to negotiate. We don't just have to cave. Um, I just, like, I went through this with Jalen Green. And Jalen Green has not had the greatest, like, last five games, you know, after his scorching hot streak. Once they started Evan, playing some real teams again. Yeah, what? but Evan Mobley's 22, man. Like, he's 22 years old. Yes, I agree. People, people are going out good, on these guys way too fast. Just way good, too he, fast. He's a good young player. I'm not, I'm not saying that he should be out of the league. I'm not saying that they should give him away for a nickel. But I, I also don't think he's where they thought he would be. And I don't think he's where the league thought he would be. And when you talk about... That's, to, that's probably build, true. When you try, when you're talking about trying to build this thing forward in Cleveland, and look, I think there's a real chance Donovan Mitchell's there next season on an extension. So I, I don't like. I don't think the sky is falling. I, why I think do you? Why lose, do you? Why do you think that? Uh, because I think if you look around, there's not a lot of necessarily obvious landing spots for him by a trade. I also think 
he seems fairly happy there from the times I've been around him. And you're also talking about, about a guy who has dealt with a bunch of injury issues over the second half of this season. And, you know, I think if you look at Giannis or a lot of these guys um, over the past few years, when we weren't sure they would extend, I think the general belief around the league at this point is if you extend on a deal like that, you could get your money now and you can ask for a trade later if you want. So I'm not predicting that's going to happen necessarily. I also don't think it's like the fate of Copley is leaving is my point. Like, I don't think it's, I don't, I don't think everything is off in Cleveland if they lose in the first round necessarily, just based off of no. they've had all these injuries, you can sort of excuse some things away, but you know, the, to me, the biggest question there going forward is just the overall Evan Mobley discussion and sort of what do you view of him as your, in terms of where he's headed going forward? Because you might be right. Like, he's a super young guy. Five years from now, we could be talking about him as, you know, battling Victor for Defensive Player of the Year and averaging 25 a game and looking that, like... That, uh, that, photo, that photo might be over for everybody. Like, that, uh, that, 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 that might be done might for be. a while. But we could be talking about him as a you know, the a top 10 player in the league and a, a guy that has realized a lot of his immense potential. So Bobby, like, go. it's not off the board. No, I, I listen, I think a couple, couple of things here. I think for Evan Mobley, I think if you're looking at it from a financial standpoint, his agent is going to say, wait a minute, you gave Darius Garland a max contract two years ago. This is, you know, based off what, right? Based off uh, basically a lottery team here. I think it's from, I think the playoffs will play a huge, huge, huge role if this team loses in five games in the first round or you know or six games um in in the first round i think it's it's hard to justify paying three guys 150 million dollars I, I i think and i think if you're i don't think you do anything to the roster unless you get a commitment from mitchell off the bat and then if you when and if you do then i'm saying okay in the the non Darius Garland minutes. So that December, whatever it was 13th stretch of games, the, the month and a half without with Mitchell as your primary ball handler. Is that the way that we build this, the, the uh, how we move forward and Garland is kind of my piece to move in a, in a trade um, in, a, in a trade down the road. And as, as you guys have said, like the, 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 out of all the teams that Tim had listed, as far as how the playoffs could impact I just think the impact in Cleveland, if they fizzle or they go far, is going to be monumental here. Certainly could I, be. And look, I think you mentioned you mentioned that pairing in the backcourt. Like, if Donovan Mitchell does extend, let's say he gives that commitment, Donovan Mitchell is going to have a lot of juice in Cleveland and a lot of ability to, I think, dictate what that team looks like. And that's sort of the first thing I – you would have to look at is the best that team has looked in the past two years was that stretch with him and Jared Allen on the court and the other two guys hurt. And, you know, they had three shooters around those two guys. And, you know, that, that I think is going to weigh heavy on people if he stays in terms of what their overall picture is going to look like. If they get their full rotation back, you know, Levert off the bench, a coral off the bench in the right lineups, like they could get, and, and again, the super staggering that you're talking about, both the guards and the bigs, they could snap back into the, that kind of rhythm that they had. And I think, Tim, you started this discussion with a very important note that, yes, they went on that 17-1 and one run, a lot of it without Garland and Mobley. It did continue when those guys came back. Like, they were winning games with all four of their big guys, mm -hmm. not with the same clarity, maybe, but it wasn't like they came back and the slump started immediately. They were still a very good team with those four guys, and then the injuries and everything hit. I think that's important to note. On Mitchell, um, yeah, well, I don't know what's going to happen. It must be quite a dilemma for a player because you're right. The history suggests you take the money and you, and you deal with it later if you want to leave. It does expose you to a lot of time wasted haggling your way out and a lot of public scrutiny that some players have an appetite for and some don't. It, it must be appealing to just be like, oh, I can just make this free and unfettered decision. Like, I, it, it just as a player, it would be interesting to me. But if he does extend, I, I, I said, I just made this up out of thin air last week. I, I don't know how it came into my mind, but like, if he does extend and I'm the Spurs, Garland is a guy that I'm calling about as, as like, can we, is there a deal here for us where we pay, pair him with Wembenyama as like this point guard that we've been searching, we've been searching for. Um, 
Uh, I don't know if I have any other Cleveland thoughts. Good luck, Cavaliers. Uh, I wanted to get both of you. I'm doing my awards, picking my picking my picks. I'm making progress. I think I'm done with. I think you I'm not done. doing awards this year. Well, I'm making my picks anyway because it's fun to do. Um, it's giving me a hard time. I think I'm done with with a bunch of them. I'm having the hardest time with defensive player of the year and all defense. Uh, and third team all NBA is just a cluster for me. Um, well, I can help I, you with your defense player of the year. There's one very obvious choice. Plays so you're going Gobert, right? Yeah. Yes. Every, all the, everything does point to to Gobert. Um, the best defensive player on the best defensive team that is winning because of defense. That seems like a pretty easy argument to me. I understand there's a certain guy in San Antonio that my uh, I can't the, get the host yet. of my podcast uh, loves to talk about every three seconds along with Cavs Corner. Which wow! Sure we'll do our next pod. Oh, that's a it's a sponsored by no one segment of the pod. I'm sure there will be a Cavs Corner on the the next episode of the Hoop Collective, like there was on the last one and the one before that and the one before that. But uh, <laughs> look, Victor's had an amazing back half of the year. He's also on a team that's 19 and 59. So, as you pointed okay. out before, and as McMahon has said, there's going to be many years in the future when Victor Wembanyama is the Defensive Player of the Year. Might be as soon as next year. Might be the next several years. But this year, for me, it's pretty clearly Rudy Gobert. I guess, I'd, I guess I'm guilty of approaching the award, like, with the assumption that it's Gobert. But let me see, because is there, is there a way to craft an argument for anybody else? And I haven't found it yet. Um, not that I want to, but it's just like, I just want to make sure that all, my, my assumption defense, is correct. All defense first team is, is a challenge. Well, let me, I mean, all right, Bobby, do you have a vote? No, no, no. So, no. so let me, I have a vote. I, yeah. I kept mine. And I know Zach didn't, but what, um, what are you, what is the, the philosophy, uh, in terms of whether, cause obviously for people that don't know in the past, yeah. All defensive team used to be two guards yeah. and three front court players. Yep. And all NBA used to be two guards, two forwards, and a center, which I yep. personally thought was perfectly fine. I didn't think the NBA needed to change it. This year, the NBA changed both of them. So now they're both positionless across yep. the board. Now, if you're just trying to have the best defensive players in the league, you yep. probably should have eight centers. Right on your top ten all. Defense. I don't. I don't. I don't think that's true. Any. I don't think that's true this year. So I would say. I would say like right now, my first team all defense would be. I'd have four centers on it, and I think that's okay. Like if you're telling me to go positionless, I'm going positionless with both. Like I heard Simmons debating all NBA yesterday and saying, "Well, I'm not gonna. I'm. I'm gonna go traditional for first and second team, but then I get the third team and I don't want to put a center on. So now I'm going to take advantage of the positionless thing and do it. I think it's either, either, or like you got to do it either or. So I'm going first team, all defense. I think the four best defense players in the NBA this year have been Gobert, Wembenyama, Bam, and Anthony Davis. And they're all going to be on my first team. And the last spot is going to be a wing or a guard. It's probably going to be Derek white or Herb Jones, Jr. One of those two will headline my second team, but there's not a center that I'm dying to put on that team. I think that could be a wing and guard heavy group of teams. Now, Brook Lopez would have a case. Uh, I'm, you know, Giannis. You can classify him as whatever you want to classify him as. Sure. Uh, there, maybe I'm missing somebody, but I think that second team could be, if you wanted it to be, it could be almost all guards. You could put Jaden yeah. McDaniel's, Kawhi, Suggs. I mean, there's all the Caruso. Yeah, I more meant. I think. I think I'm gonna sort of hew to what the traditional defensive player of the year ballot would look like, I think, for first and second team. Because I think if you're trying to con construct a all defensive team, like I think it's there's I think there's some merit to saying, like, yes, generally you're right. I you could make different arguments year to year, but generally the best players in the league and the most important de player defensive players in the league are centers. Because it's just historically been by far the most important defensive position. And you're by nature of that going to have mostly bigs on the team in most years. But I think then you're sort of short shrifting guys like Derek White or Al Caruso or Herb Jones or some of these other guys who are vitally important defensive players across the league. 
Um, so I've just been trying to square how to. Yeah, I don't disagree. Do there's that. no right exactly. way to do it. Just do whatever you want. I think every voter can do whatever they want and even contradict themselves here and there if they want to, because the league has made this amorphous and strange. So I want, can you each give me your te very tentative in pencil? Obviously, we still have a week to go. Third team, all NBAs. First team is done. People can argue about the fifth spot. Second team is going to have mostly the same names. Maybe one guy slides to third, one guy's whatever slides to first. I, third team is just a jumble for me, and I don't know quite what to do yet. I have my I have my leanings, I have my leanings, but I'm interested to hear you, Bobby. You give me your third tentative, tentative third team. Sabonis, Curry, LeBron, Halliburton, and that's in pencil. Okay, and then a big a big list of who knows. I mean. I had I had Durant, but I think he's more second. I I'm, I moved Durant up there um, to second team, and then it's like the list of Kawhi, Paul George, Booker, Gobert, Maxi. It's a mess, right? Like there's a group of guys. Like <laughs> I mean, so those... I have I have Kawhi and LeBron on my second team ten tentatively tentatively. LeBron I had on third team for a while. I slid him up. Uh, and I've had Kawhi's second team pretty much the whole the whole time. Obviously, he's missing some games here and there, but it's but but I I'm not those are not final. Um, Tim, yeah, I mean honestly, I have the top six guys on my All NBA ballot are going to be Luca Shea, Jokic, Giannis, Tatum, and Jalen Brunson, and then after that, I'm still trying to figure out what the back half of my ballot looks like honestly because frankly this uh, it's really the, the change of this to a positionless thing has made this i think extraordinarily complicated because you can there was sort of again i like the fact that there was like a natural looking team on the all nba team every year and it was like this for 60 years like I think it's insane the NBA had not decided to, have to change this. It's also amazing the NBA changed it in the year Joel Embiid played 35 games because this was a reaction to the two best players in the league being centers. And now the <laughs> guy who would have been on the team is now not yeah, on it. Now first again, team all NBA falls into place and it's like a, it is a normal team just by yes. almost happenstance. SGA, yes. Luka, Giannis, Jokic, and take your pick. I have Tatum, but it's like, oh, sure. it's it's a for, it's a regular team. And then after that, it's like, wait, do the other ones have to be regular teams too? Because I, yeah, I don't think they're going to be. Yeah, it's. I mean, the NBA loves to overreact to these things. They took center off the all-star ballot because they decided centers were gone, and now the two best players in the league the last five years have been centers. I mean, it, they, they do this stuff all the time for no reason. But um, yeah, so you had a top. You had a top six. So, and, and my second team tentatively, I, I just said the first team with Tatum is the fifth guy. My second team tentatively would be Brunson. To your point, you was your sixth guy. Yeah, Le Kawhi, AD, Durant, and LeBron. Are, yeah, I mean, I feel like I feel like LeBron will be on it somewhere. I would guess that Davis will be on it. Kawhi should be on it. Durant, I would think Booker will be on it. Steph will be on it. Edwards will be on it. So yeah, then you're down to like, you know, I I don't know. It's it's gonna be. So Steph will be interesting because I I Simmons had Steph. My initial run through, I had Steph. My second run through, I still had Steph. You guys seem to have Steph. I think Why that's you? good. Well, I think that's going to be an interesting test case because ours. I gave my first ten guys. Here, here's like nine names for the last five. Right, Anthony Edwards hasn't come up yet. He's got to be on an All NBA team. I said him. He'll be on mine. Jalen Brown hasn't come up yet. There's a he school would be of, on. He would be on over Halliburton. There, 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 over there's Halliburton. a there, there's a school of thought that the Celtics, as by far the best regular season team, need to have two guys. I don't necessarily buy into that because they're they're strength is their top end depth which is a which is a oxymoron i realize but top end depth is a real thing they have like five great players on their team um but jalen brown paul george devin booker tyrese halliburton Demonis sabonis and look i had kind of squeezed him off to the side tyrese maxi re-announced himself with that 52 point game the other day against san antonio to kind of save philadelphia's hopes of getting out of the play-in um that's I love a, Tyrese Maxey. He's had a great year. Paul it's George. Me, it's hard for me to put Tyrese on there when they've struggled so much without Joel. And I, know I don't. I don't all, disagree. I know it's not all Tyrese's fault. Obviously, they've got a flawed roster, but they are like basically a 
30 win team or less when Joel doesn't play. So they're still to... plus one per 100 possessions when Maxi plays and MB doesn't for the season. No, I know. Despite he's, the he's been, he's been, he's been awesome. And by so the way, Bobby's point, my... point, to Bobby's point, just real quick, because I don't think people have thought about this. I think Tyrese Halberton's a tremendous player. And I think it sucks that he hurt his hamstring back in January and has clearly not looked like the same guy since. However, since he hurt his hamstring, in 33 games, he's averaging 16 points. He's shooting 44% from the field. He's shooting 32% from three. That's over half yeah. the season. What are Steph's stats for the last 20 games? Uh, for the last 20 games? I can try to find that for you. I mean, the the points are higher, and the shooting is – I mean, I he's had a couple of good games recently. It was like at 40%. Steph- Steph over his last 37 games is shooting, is scoring 26 a game on 40% three point shooting. Uh, I can let, let me do this from March 1st. We'll see where that's at. Some fun stats hunting quickly here. Uh, da, 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 that's 16 games. Let's just do since the all star break for Steph. That will, that will be the quickest way to do this. Since the all star break, Steph Curry is. Shooting, he's scoring 23 points a game on 36% three-point shooting with five assists over his so, last 21 games. I think there will there will be people who – I'm curious to see how many ballots he makes. He would make my ballot just because he's still shooting 40% plus from three. And considering the degree of difficulty of his shots, that's like 50% for a normal player. And on and on over 11 attempts a game, which is great. And, and I just think the numbers – will never ever capture what he is as an offensive force. The way he just the entire there's certain there's like six guys in the league and when Benyama is becoming one of these guys, the whole game is different when they're on the floor. And I by yeah. that I mean the geometry of it, the feel of it, what's possible, how much space has to be covered. The entire geometry of the game changes when they play. And Steph is one of those guys and has held that team together amid innumerable dramas and injuries and self-inflicted wounds and all that. I, I just think like, I just think it's, it's going to be hard. Like he's better than Jalen Brown. He's better than Paul George. He's better than these other, he's just better. He's better than Tyrese Maxey. He's been better than Tyrese Halliburton since the hamstring injury. At least Tyrese Halliburton had an argument before that. I don't, it's going to be, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tight. Like, and I think Cal Burton makes my team. I think Bobby said he had him too, because ultimately he was so good before that, and he's leading the league in assists. I'd then, you're, still... then you're squeezing Jalen Brown. Someone's getting squeezed. Jalen yeah, Brown. I would, so... I would probably have Hal Burton on there over over Jalen. But I. But again, it's the point. I the only point I was making was for as incredible as Tyrese was the first three months of the year when he was a MVP candidate and might have made first team. The fact he he's been that rough over the last couple of months, which again, I feel bad because he's been playing through this hamstring injury and it's not really his fault. He hasn't looked the same physically, but you know, the numbers at some point are what they are from that standpoint. What about Sabonis? I mean, he's going to be in consideration for my third team. I have to think about it. There's a, but there's a lot of like, I haven't people were sort of calling me the last couple of days, other voters about, Hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? And I, I, this is the week I you really you bounce stuff around, you think about it all year, and then this week you really sit down and start to spend a few hours on each of these and figure out what you're gonna do. So bonus is neck and neck for a number one in total minutes. I, I there's part of me that wants to reward him for that, even though I just like I think Paul George is a better basketball player than Demonis Sabonis. I think Jalen Brown is probably a better basketball player than him. Halliburton, I think, is a better basketball player than him. He's just played a ton of minutes for a team that needs every one of them. It's gonna be it, there's gonna be some painful, some painful omissions. There's just no, there's only 15 spots. There's no, there's just no way around it. Um. Okay. Bobby Marks, Tim Bonteps, any closing thoughts other than uh, maybe it's not the Mets year this year? I am just really excited, even more than normal, for the playoffs because, like you said correctly before. You know, we spend six months watching the regular season and you learn 10 times as much about the league and where it's headed and what's going on over the next two months. And I mean, Bobby's lived it. He's been in two NBA finals and multiple other deep playoff runs. And there's just nothing like 
going through the playoffs and seeing how teams react in the crucible of it. And, um, you know, you look at, we, I mean, we spent all this time talking about Cleveland. They're going to be interesting. I mean, if Milwaukee implodes in the first round or second round or something, who knows what happens there after their season. That's you've an uh-oh. Oklahoma, you've got Oklahoma City coming in the playoffs with this super young team trying to make a deep run. You know, we'll see what see if the Lakers and Warriors can get in, what they can do. We'll see what Minnesota can do. We've, I mean, we've, they've had this incredible season. They've got this chaos with their ownership. They've got this financial cliff coming. Um you know, can Denver, you know, can Denver repeat? Can Boston finally break through? Like there's, there's just so even, it feels like even for a normal playoff year, there's just a lot of stuff at stake across the board. And it, it's just as somebody who spends the year thinking about the league and where it's going and why it's going there and what's coming next, like the next two months, you know, Bobby spends all this time working on these off season guides that are awesome. And so much of what he's doing is dictated by, how the next couple months play out and you know what that means for where these teams are going so i'm just fired up for it to get started and we'll see if a week from now if a men either in miami or in philadelphia for sixers heat in a what would be a fairly immense play-in game if that's the game to uh either stay on the opposite side of the bracket of boston and get three or four days off before your first game or go to an eight nine game where the win- reward if you win is you have a game in boston 36 hours later. So. Boston will also be watching that very carefully. Um, yeah. Because Emb- Embiid, Embiid is back. All right, Bobby Marks, Tim Bontemps, invaluable insight as always. Thank you for your time and your analysis, and I will see you guys at an arena or a studio or somewhere soon. Get some rest. Playoffs are coming. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, man.